So Lindsay Bergen is a writer, oral historian, and she is a National Geographic explorer. Her work has appeared in The Atlantic, National Geographic, The Guardian, Smithsonian, and Oxford American. Uh, Tree Thieves is her first book, and today's event is the first event of the book, which is got published yesterday. So let's give her a round of applause. I'm very honored that we can do the first event for your book, so thank you for that. Thank Wonderful. You. Um, Ainsley uh, Cruikshank is a Vancouver-based journalist who works with the Narwhal as their new BC Biodiversity Reporter. Congratulations on your new gig. And she has previously written for The Walrus, The Toronto Star, and Star Metro Vancouver. So they're going to talk for about 40 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. So I think Carly brought a great question, and then you'll have about 15 minutes at the end to ask that. And that's all from me. Let me just turn this off, and we can get started. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you, Lindsay, for being here, um, and for all of you for coming. Um, the book was really amazing. I, I thought it was a really thought-provoking read, and especially um, in BC, obviously these issues are so relevant. There's concerns um, about um, both legal logging uh, in the province and you know calls to really protect old growth forests. So lots to chat about. Um, but first I was just wondering if you could give us a bit of an overview of what timber poaching actually is and mm -hmm. Um, how big of a concern it is. Sure. Um, so I just want to check that this is okay, this level, yeah. Um, so timber poaching happens on kind of all different sorts of levels. The, the poaching that I cover in the book uh, tends to be individual instances of logging from conservation land, crown lands, park lands, this type of thing in uh, British Columbia and then down into national park and uh, forest service lands in the United States. It also happens on a much larger scale uh, with a more kind of industrial clear cutting, clear -cutting uh, uh, ambition behind it in other countries in particular. Um, but in this book, I'm looking at it uh, on a tree by tree basis, really. Um, and it often is targeted towards old growth trees because they're very valuable because they're so rare. So it's a pretty big issue. I think in the book, I'm gonna get the number wrong, but in the billions, in it terms is. of the market, right? Yes, so um, it's estimated that in North America overall, uh, timber poaching is worth about a billion dollars every year or contributes to that market. Uh, the Forest Service in the US has estimated it at 100 million um, from their land alone, and it's about one in 10 trees that is logged on their land uh, that is illegally logged um, or poached. Um, that number is a little bit outdated, <laughs> uh, so they don't keep uh, very consistent tracking on it but that's the number that they use still, um, so it's probably around about the same. Yeah. And what first drew you to the issue of timber poaching and you know, to write a book about it? Yeah, um, so in 2012, there was a case of poaching in the Carmana Walbrin on Vancouver Island. Uh, it was a two-part operation. I read about it in a CBC story. It was just kind of a quick little hit. And at the time I thought, I was working as a freelance journalist and I thought, oh, this would be a really good magazine story because you could follow the rangers and you could take a look into how they're gonna um, investigate this crime that's happened and we can get a sense of the mills. And then when I started researching it, I started realizing that it was a much kind of more complicated, complex story, particularly because I had no idea that it was worth so much <laughs> money and that it was happening so much. Um, and so I ended up around 2013 or so deciding that this was gonna be a book length project that could really get into the socioeconomic drivers behind it. That was and really what I wanted to dig into and the history mm. as well. Um, I, I think that's one of the incredible things about the book too is just how um, it really gets at the nuances and those complex factors that you know drive people to, to take trees. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought it was really fascinating too how you kind of talked about how those strict sort of preservation or, and conservation policies, how they um, in some ways have contributed to this problem because, mm -hmm. uh, because in, they left communities behind. Like, um, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about, yeah, how, how that happened. Sure, so um, the way that this was initially presented to me first was through interviews that I was doing with investigators and so I, 
I'd often ask kind of, how is this happening and, and who's doing it? And they were all very cooperative and very open in saying, you know, uh, a lot of this land is surrounded by small towns that were once reliant on the timber industry that over time, uh, you know, have lost that kind of uh, consistent, whether it was consistent or not is kind of up for debate, but that, that kind of foundation economy. Um, and that's, that's a narrative that has really been adopted by the towns themselves. So when I started reaching out to poachers, it, it became an echo of that, where they were saying, listen, we are from here, we love it here. My grandfather moved here, my great-grandfather, they worked in logging, I was ready to work in logging, and then that was taken away from me was really the, uh, the wording that was often used in my interviews. And this was something that I was seeing through history as well when I was doing historical uh, reading and, and history work in the archives was a lot of um, anger around access to timber and access to the woods being taken away um, and the, the kind of rhetoric around that uh, was also quite upsetting to a lot of folk that lived in that area. So it, it almost became kind of a self-fulfilling <laughs> motivation in a mm. way. Interesting. Um, I, I think you sort of get at a lot of those um, complexities through the characters that you met in mm -hmm. um, in, in Oric, California. Um, and of course, you touch in the book on um, timber poaching both in, um, well, across the Pacific Northwest and, 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 and in Peru um, as well. But you really focus on, on this community of Oric, California. Yeah. And so how did you come to focus on Oric? Yeah. Well, Oric um, has had, uh, in recent years, a few kind of uh, well-known poaching cases, which is first how I came to hear about it. I knew previously that redwood poaching uh, was happening, and also particularly burl poaching. So burls are these kind of growths that come off a tree, usually in old growth. Um, they have really beautiful wood on the inside. And on redwoods, they are just massive because redwoods are really massive. So often what the poaching that happens in that forest is poachers will go out and just slice the burl right off the tree because they often grow in these kind of like big bulbs, like big bellies. Mm. Um, and so I had read some news stories about that and I knew that actually Redwood Park was, was quite open to, to chatting about it. And I, it was almost a, a really good microcosm to look at because the Red, uh, Oric is the um, gateway community to Redwoods National Park. So they are the park that's right at the very southern end of the park, of the, sorry, they are the town on the southern end of the park and you have to drive through them to get into the park. So they really experienced the founding of the park uh, acutely when it happened. Hmm, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I think you, you talk about um, in the book, well, I've never been to Oric. Yeah. Can, can you just describe what the town is like, you know, yeah. as the gateway to this park? Yeah, sure. So um, it's very small. I think it has, I think the line in the book from, from one of the people that lives there is that the sign welcomes you and says that there's 350 people, but 200 of them are sheep. Like very, <laughs> very small. Uh, everything is built right along the highway. Um, so all the businesses face out onto Highway 101, which is the Redwood Highway, and it's quite iconic. I mean, you may have seen it on Instagram, just these kind of famous shots of redwood on both sides and creates this kind of tunnel appearance. And they have a lot of burl shops because again, these burls are, they, they create this, they provide this really beautiful wood and it's often turned into these bowls. If you've ever seen a kind of a bowl turned out of wood, it's really a very beautiful pattern. Looks like a wave kind of. Um, and this was a, an economy that had really sprung up after the park came in because it was a way to use wood and sell it to tourists, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but since 1968, when the park was founded, and now it's really the town has had a very kind of steep uh, economic decline. Much of the town is, is deteriorated in many ways and just hasn't been upkept. Most of the houses certainly are in need of repair. Um, and so, like a lot of people, if you visit Humboldt County, they'll say, or you just drive through Oric, don't get out there. Mm. You know, it's, it's not nice. Like maybe they used to have a gas station, but it's barely operating that kind of thing. So it really, um, when the park came in, they were told that tourism would really kind of fill this hole of timber and that really did not prove to be the case for them. Mm. And do you have a sense of why, why tourism couldn't help fill that hole? Well, I mean, I think everyone probably has a theory that lives there. There's 
lots of reasons. Some people would say that uh, a fair number of people moved out uh, when logging shut down. They were kind of moving on to the next community. Um, and so a huge taxpayer base left with it. Um, the, the county, uh, many people kind of place blame on the county for not investing enough in this town when they really needed it right away as opposed to kind of a trickle out over the years um, hmm. tax payment system. Um, it's It kind of depends on people's experiences of the town. Okay, so, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, one of the really fascinating aspects of the book too is just the, the people that you got to speak to uh -huh. in Oric who, who are tree poachers them yeah. themselves and yeah. um, they spoke pretty openly it seems like yeah. to you. So how did that come about? How did you meet these? Can you tell us a bit about the people first of all and, and yeah. sort of how they became really central characters in, in your book? Sure, so I knew um, when I first started my reporting down there I knew of one case that was currently in the courts, uh, one from a previous kind of couple years before that had been sealed up, but that poacher had spoken to one local newspaper, so I thought, oh, maybe he'd be kind of interested in talking to me. And there was this mythical poacher that I had read about um, online uh, called, he called himself the Redwood Bandit. And so I knew that when I got there, I wanted to kind of start looking around for this guy, but I didn't have any, any way to know, so. I showed up, um, it's such a small town. I had interviews planned already uh, with the Redwood National Park because I could kind of arrange that and I was staying for a bit of time so I knew I could take my time and visit folks and um, I just started, you know, I went to the cafe, I told the cafe owner what I was writing about and she said, the woman who was cleaning the floors in the back room was married to Danny Garcia, who was the, the first case that had already gone through the court system, and she gave, she said, just come with me across the street. <laughs> so I went across the street to his uncle's house, and I interviewed them, and then they put me in touch with Danny, and I, the, the course that was going, or sorry, the, the case that was going at the time was Derek Hughes's case, and it, it lasted quite a long time, and I knew that he was very unlikely to talk to me because he was, he was maintaining his innocence at that point, um, and so, um, I just had to wait that one out, and one day I very luckily was provided the phone number of the Redwood Bandit, and when I called him, he said, Derek Hughes is here, would you like to interview him? He's sitting in my living room. <laughs> and I said, yes, please, and I interviewed them both <laughs> that day, so it was very kind of serendipitous, but I had done a, a little bit of reporting on it as well to get to that point, so. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and I just want to say too that um, particularly with, with Chris Guffey, the, the, the Redwood Bandit, uh, he was really looking for an opportunity to speak. I think everyone was very open. I, I don't think a lot of them had actually been asked before why they did this. I think they just kind of had been written about uh, without being contacted even just to say what happened. Right, and to yeah. talk about sort of why they were doing And why this. they would do it, yeah. And so what did they tell you about why they were doing this? I think um, Chris and Danny had very similar backstories. They had very similar histories. Um, in fact, their families were, were at points interrelated, or like married, intermarried. Um, and they had, their families, their great-grandfathers had arrived in Oric and started working in logging when the Redwood, the first kind of Redwood boom was happening in 1850s kind of early 20th century um, and both of them had been told you know this is what you will do and Chris Guffey says you know there are pictures of me on logging equipment in diapers like brand new baby and his dad owned a business and it you know it it was very much instilled in him that he would take on that business when he turned 18 and um, by the time that that point had come uh, 1968 had passed when the Redwood Park had been instated and then there was an expansion in 1978 and the expansion took a, a lot more uh, kind of logging land that had been previously held by the Forest Service that that had been kind of preserved for logging purposes. It took that kind of off the market and many businesses closed because of that and including his dad's. Um, and so both of them had a lot of resentment related to this. They had felt that, um, that their families and that the people that they had grown up around were not cared about because this was just, in their perception, decided and, and 
foisted upon the town and they were told to adapt, but there was no kind of understanding of how difficult that may, might be or why someone might not want to. Um, I think that a lot of times um, the transition during that time was framed as we'll retrain you and you'll get a job without understanding the connection to the job in the first place and that mm -hmm. some folks might not actually want that and that they might be tied to the land and the forest and want to work it at the same time. And so that's what I was hearing from them. Derek has a little bit of a different story because he moved to, the, uh, to Oric when he was 10. Um, but it's such a small town and he really kind of jumped into the narrative in that town, which was a lot of anger toward the park, a lot of resentment, and a lot of desire to kind of quote unquote get back at them. Mm -hmm. And so um, when he had a hard time finding work, it was very easy to find the materials to go out and, and do it. And and I think one of the kind of um, messages that comes through is that at times they were doing this to sell the wood, so they yeah. said a few times to, to pay to pay rent. Um, yeah, for sure. And um, yeah, they they do say that explicitly a few times, right? So I think actually there's a good um, a good quote there from Danny, I think, who uh, said that he had been encouraged by been encouraged by others in the town to just move and he said well I can't I can't m get my deposit in my first month down so I'm kind of like in this cycle you know and there there is another motivating factor as well um, that that I talk about a fair bit, bit in the book and that's because when I was doing my interviews around this particularly interviewing the Forest Service in Washington and um, the natural resource officers up here in, on the island in British Columbia uh, they were saying as respectfully as they could, we have a meth problem in our town and drugs are really linked to this and people who poach trees do meth. And so I really wanted to kind of know how true that was. Um, and it, it did prove to be, to be one strain of motivation. I don't think it was the whole thing. I don't think that everyone who poaches a tree is, is doing it to get drug money, but it was certainly part of the narrative for sure. Yeah, kind of getting at again those like complex factors that are, are leading right. Um, I mean, what to it's kind of like what leads to the drug use, right? Right. There was a deeper foundation to that. Right. That the economic um, uh -huh. challenges facing facing these communities. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I guess the the fact that they're able to sell the wood also broaches the question of well, who's buying yeah. the wood? Yeah. Um, can you tell, tell us a little bit about where this wood is even ending up? Mm -hmm. It goes, it gets sold on all sorts of places. So uh, on the island, on Vancouver Island, it's very common for, for wood to be sold as firewood um, and posted for sale on Facebook Marketplace, um, Kijiji. And that's a lot of resource officers will, will do some research <laughs> on there and to kind of get a, get a sense of what might be moving and for how much. Um, the burls tend to be sold to burl shops uh, because they're, their own kind of economy in a way because they are used in these kind of artistic ways. Um, but it really depends on what the wood is going to be used for. Uh, a lot of times it might go to a small mill that knows that they can move it quite quickly and, and might be willing to turn a blind eye. Mm. Sometimes they're not turning a blind eye. There's a case in Washington where the paperwork around some wood that was sold to a mill in the town called Tumwater was forged so well that they really believed it. And it took uh, the Forest Service a lot of work to prove that this had been fo uh, forged, the paperwork, and that the wood was, was poached. So it ends up in all sorts of places. It often ends up, particularly wood from Washington, maple, from here as well, ends up as musical instruments. There's a, there's a big industry for that um, because th that type of wood apparently conducts sound really well and it's mm. very beautiful. Sometimes it ends up as tables sold to artisans and stuff like that. So it wow, ends so up in all sorts of places. Sometimes it's milled very quickly into shakes and cedar planks and stuff like that. So, so it could be sort of things that you're we're buying yep. unknowingly too. Yeah, for sure. Um, I want to kind of come to BC and the work that you did here as mm -hmm. well. Um, um, Maybe first you can just tell us a little bit about sort of what you found in terms of how big of an issue timber poaching is 
here in this province? Yeah, so before the, before the pandemic broke out, there was a story uh, that, came, that came out about uh, just how challenging this had become for some natural resource officers on the island. Um, and I did some reporting around that at the time, and, and the numbers were, were really interesting. I mean, they were, they were saying anecdotally that they were run off their feet uh, with, with just how much wood was being stolen every day and, and then trying to investigate mm -hmm. that wood, those, those kitchen sites as they found them. And when I went out, um, I, I spent some time shadowing a, a resource officer kind of outside of Nanaimo. And we went out on a forest service road. He was gonna show me a poaching site that he had found the day before, and then we found three more on the way to that poaching site. So it was very clearly happening really quickly. And I think that the paperwork they sent me, and I'm not fully sure of the exact number, um, it showed that in a span of three years, there were over a thousand forest crimes and that 700 of those were poaching incidences. That's a fair amount over, over three years. Um, and it's actually continued. So during the pandemic, uh, if I'm sure many homeowners or, or other people here know that the price of wood just went crazy um, and there was an increased demand, or sorry, an increased push for, for poaching during that time as well and just, a couple months ago, there, there a story came out again saying that there had been a, uh, at least a thousand tracked poaching cases in forests kind of dotted around the island. So wow. it's quite uh, yeah, quite pervasive. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm wondering, I mean, obviously in BC there's, um, you know, a lot of discussion happening right now around forestry and how yeah. um, we manage forests. A lot of concerns about um, clear-cut logging yeah. and... Um, you know, legal logging as, as well as obviously um, there are concerns about timber poaching as well. And I'm just wondering um, how, how do you think that the, the issues that played out in Oric are there, um, like how do you think it compares, I guess, to, to the conversations and the discussions and the issues that are playing out right now in British Columbia? I think that there are, there are kind of I don't know if lessons is the right word, but I think that there are some perspectives that can be heard from the interviews in Oric and, and Washington as well that, that kind of talk about what was happening during the War of the Woods, during the Timber Wars, which was a kind of, if I remember correctly, mid-1980s to, to kind of early 1990s um, moment of kind of great social upheaval around forests and lots of protesting going on at that time until uh, I'm not going to know the exact date that this happened re more recently, but until Ferry Creek protests, this was the largest act of civil disobedience in Canadian history. So um, this was kind of very echoing during when Forest, when Ferry Creek was happening, uh, which it is still going on. But um, last summer or two summers ago, my time is all messed up. Kind Pandemic of, time, anyway. yeah. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, there were, if, if you read it all about the War of the Woods and if you read it all about Clayoquot Sound and, and then followed Ferry Creek, the, their parallels were, were like this, you know. Um, and the same with the Timber Wars, which were happening in Northern California and Washington and Oregon. And a lot of the interviews that I did in those regions, they, they referenced this very angry time in the Pacific Northwest as very recent memory for a lot of folks. So they were saying, I remember how they talked about our town during the Timber Wars when the Northern Spotted Owl was kind of going through this process of becoming endangered species and stopping the logging and all of that. And it just echoes, it, it, it's basically, it's, it's very similar to the same debate as what we're having around Ferry Creek in many ways. And I think that there's a lot of resentment around that that echoes today in the Pacific Northwest from these kind of industrial, or former logging communities that are kind of going through transitions into different economies. Um, and if we're trying to get people on board, I think there might be some lessons to be learned in, in kind of how people remember that and how people remember the discussions and, and stuff around that time. I think this idea of communities and transitions is, uh -huh. um, we're hearing so much about that right now, not just around logging, obviously, but, um, Oil and gas. Oil and gas, Everything. like uh, so many communities that are kind of dependent on these resources yeah. that are, are having an impact on the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis. Um, if, if 
I mean, this might be a, a tough question for you to answer, but um, <laughs> if you could give any advice or lessons that you were able to take from Oric in terms of how do you how do you start having those conversations about what a a, a real transition looks like? Um, Actually, I so and maybe not even from Oric, but if I can recommend, there was a there was a story that came out recently, and I don't. You'd have to Google the publication because I'm blanking, but the community of Field BC, if anyone knows where that is, on the way to Calgary, um, there was some real long grassroots organizing that recently happened there to get the, t the town to commit to full transition by like 2030 to be fully renewable. Mm. And they did that, like I, I read a story about it and I, so I apologize, you'd have to look it up, but it took years. And what they did was they literally had all community activists spearheading talking to their neighbors going all the time and talking to their neighbors about what's going on what are you what are you what do you what what do you fear might happen okay listening to it not trying to argue even then but going back and processing it and thinking about how can we talk about this deeper so i think that 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 approach has clearly worked um, because i i'm not sure what they mine there but this was a mining town that has now committed to detransition with a fair amount of their town supporting it in a, in a vote. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't simply that the town city hall or, or town hall or whatever decided to do this. It was the town's people themselves. Um, I know that that takes a lot of time and so a lot of people don't want to hear that because we do have to work quickly as I understand the, the argument but um, that's one example of that working really well. That did not happen in Oric. You know, um, when the park was expanding in 78, I think, because it's a national park, it was a federal kind of government um, initiative. I think they sent out a Congress, a, a committee from Congress that took a lot of notes on what people said and just didn't use it. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of, like, people remember that. People remember that now. Hmm. So. Right, right. Um, no, I think that I think that's Im important to remember, just kind of, yeah, the... Um, importance of talking to people who will be affected well, that's and what actually hearing from them worked in the end right mm -hmm. I mean I know it sounds kind of frilly to be like sit down and talk to each other <laughs> like okay something we but could all remember because it led to votes that you needed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um w one thing that I'm curious about too is just um in I guess given the kind of concerns around legal logging that is happening right now, yeah. and then and then there's this issue of timber poaching as well. Can you just sort of um, frame a little bit how these problems, how big of a problem is timber poaching? I guess compared to sort of the um, concerns around um, industrial logging. I guess yeah, like environmentally. Yeah. I guess um, as opposed to social yes yeah yeah I mean timber poaching it, it looks small and it generally is small because it is one or two trees taken over a span of time that isn't I mean if you ever see an industrial clear cut it's shocking right what they can what those machines can do but often it's coming from conserved land so I think that that's very notable um, there's not a lot of old growth left we know that and that's that's part of what the, the fight at Fairy Creek is all about but if we've already successfully kind of in our minds conserve that and still the trees can can be taken down I think that's notable mm -hmm. um, I mean overall industrial logging is going to cause more damage right now um, but the trees that we had presumed to have preserved were meant to last for much longer than they are and that's something to to keep in mind right right no and I think that kind of linking it into the social stuff is more it's kind of like if we if we don't stop the industrial logging in a way that is effective, that gets people on board, then this will continue. The poaching will continue. Right, no. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I guess to that to that end, um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the ways that the solutions that communities are, mm -hmm. are employing to, mm -hmm. you know, prevent, prevent yeah. kind of that transition from um, stopping maybe industrial logging, but then ending up with this challenge of timber poaching? Yeah, there are a few kind of layers that this is happening. So um, the first is on the, uh, I keep saying NRO because on Crown Lands, that's who manages the land, but it might be a parks ranger. Um, the way that they have to approach this is from a law enforcement perspective. And so they're using those types of tools. So uh, there's lots of hidden cameras and trees all over 
the island, uh, you know, particularly trees that people know are very old that might be a target. Um, people, uh, rangers are working proactively to, to put cameras nearby in the hopes of maybe catching someone in the act, catching a, a license plate. Um, sometimes they are using sound activated alerts. Um, so if a you can actually tr uh, train some of these uh, through AI to recognize a chainsaw over a step for instance, and then it'll spring to life when it hears that and alert an NRO on where it is. Or they put signs very high up in the trees, actually. It's almost hard to see, and they had to move them high up because the signs were getting vandalized that say, don't poach here. <laughs> if you see someone poaching, call this number. It's illegal. And then they had to move it up because too many people didn't like them. Um, so they're, they're trying on that way. Um, for community forests, I think are really interesting. I mean, this is a problem with community forests um, here in Nanaimo. Uh, I think recently in North Cowichan, I saw a story that came out about this. And they, so because they don't have traditional ranger systems uh, like a crown land might or, or park owned by the province, they have to do their own policing work in a sense. So um, that takes different sorts of forms. The North Cowichan, and this is that's not the exact name of the of the community forest. I'd have to remember it, but um, the Sunshine Coast Community Forest actually revamped their firewood harvesting program. A community forest uh, has multiple uses, so you can go visit one and go on a hike. Um, lots of science goes on in them, so uh, you know they might pair with the university and say. There will be some monitoring going on. And then also there is some logging that happens and they, they open it up and they, they allow, since it's owned by the community, they allow community members to go in for har uh, firewood harvesting um, or they might sell a couple trees a year and keep the profits and, and donate it to management of the program or, or to a school or something like that. And they revamped their firewood program because they realized that still people were poaching off their land for firewood. And so I don't know how successful that's been. It just happened in the last couple months. Um, but they at least saw that they had a problem, you know. Um, and they've, they've hired local folk who they know needed the firewood that they suspected might have been poaching to actually chop up the wood and provide it to other community members itself. So they were, they were given that, that job. Hmm. So hopefully a, a way to, you know. Yeah, now you're in the forest and it is yours. Right, yeah. right, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm wondering over the course of your reporting if there was anything particularly th um, that kind of stood out that surprised you or sort of changed your mind about something in this issue. I mean, I think when I first started, when this story was first shared, I went back and I searched that CBC story that came out. I searched it on Twitter and I saw the retweets from 2012. And a lot of them were just saying like, what type of scum person would do this? What trash? Oh my God, you know, like you're stealing an antiquity and that could be all of this. And I think at the time I was probably more prone to agree with that than I am now. So that was a very long process, but um, kind of good to see when I went back to search in a way. I was very surprised. I did a little bit of, um, I was very lucky and I received from funds from the National Geographic Society to go to Peru because they also struggle with timber poaching. And I wanted to see how that poaching looked in a region which we might assume with, uh, was dealing with really kind of wide scale illegal logging, just vast swaths of forest. But I knew that this was also happening to singular trees on land, on, on indigenous land most often. And it looked so similar, like the things that the rangers were saying to me there and the way that even um, the, the land looked was so similar to what I saw on Vancouver Island, which I had done my reporting there before, to the point where we, stumped, we, we walked through some of this land. We saw four huge trees that had been taken down and milled right there on site and a road that was built. And we came across and the rangers said, well, okay, this is, this was a community of, uh, this was a small family of people that were squatting on the land and they had set up tents and this was what they had found money from. And when I was with the NRO on driving back to Nanaimo, he said, do you see that, that tent encampment there that, that squatters, they sometimes are, are poaching the wood, like literal parallels with, with poverty fueling it. 
Right, yeah, that just the, the economic like challenge unhoused, piece. Yeah. Homeless challenge, all of that. Yeah. Comes back to yeah, I guess those those the ways that we kind of transition communities and making sure that we're sort of yeah. taking care of, of people that are gonna be affected by these broader policy decisions too. Mm -hmm. Um, I have asked a lot of questions, so <laughs> I'm wondering if um, there's anybody in the audience that has any burning questions that they have want Lindsay to answer. Like already processed lumber? They are. They are. Yeah. 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 But anyway, I'll get Ainsley to repeat the question, then I'll answer. Sorry. So I think the question, if I heard right, was what's the um, difference in the proportion of live trees that are taken, that are alive, versus um, dead tree fall like that dead, might be yeah. collected? Yeah. Right. Both um, are, are common, so um, all of the poaching instances that I heard of in BC, in Washington and in Oregon were standing trees that were cut down entirely by a poacher. Sometimes those poachers would leave, if the tree was tall enough, they'd have to like do half, <laughs> leave the rest, cover it often with like branches and stuff, like just kind of camouflage it, load it up into a truck, drive it off and come back later. So this was pretty common. In Oric, it was a little bit different, actually. They have this really also interesting layer of poaching, which is that the redwood, the redwood, redwoods in the park might come down during a storm, float down the Redwood Creek, which is still park land, through the town, <laughs> into the ocean, and then come back up with the tide and be on the beach. And previously, that beach wood was able to be harvested for firewood, and then the park uh, essentially took away that right. And so that was technically dead, naturally fallen timber uh, that, that is now being poached off the beach. So, um, and you asked about the species, right? Yeah, well, um, as far as live trees, what are the preferred species or the most common species taken? Yeah. And as far as timber, So the, the question was just, what are the kind of preferred species that are being taken? Yeah, Douglas fir, for sure. Uh, whole trees, so the, um, the one of the poaching sites that I saw on the island uh, was it absolutely, I don't remember how old it was, but it was over, it was old growth already, so I think that the designation for that is 225, but it might be 250. 250. 250, so it was already over that, um, and it had been taken cut down, taken into two-part operation. Cedar, for sure. I think I heard about yellow cedar in Oregon. I, I think it was red cedar that I heard uh, elsewhere. Maple, certainly for musical instruments in particular. Um, Sitka spruce. What else, what other species do we have? <laughs> Hemlock. Hemlock, yeah, I don't think I can hear much about that actually. Yeah. And then red, yeah, well, I think a redwood in, is in the sequoia family, or, or maybe they're, maybe, I think they are, yeah. So, but redwood burl in particular, because redwoods are just so big that it's a huge operation, but they, there are some instances of, of whole redwoods being taken down. So, so they're taking a whole redwood? Yeah. Live? Yep. Trees? No. They're cutting it like you would, uh, okay, like just so leaving a stump behind. Tree, yeah. Tree yeah. Oh. oh, you think if it if the roots are behind, you're kind of leaving. Yeah. 
Okay. So yeah, you're right. I suppose the minute it cuts down, it ceases being a tree. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for your question. does make sense. It Challenge like to sum it up. Like <laughs> it's a, um, yeah, <laughs> I, did everyone hear the question? Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, I just need to form, form my thoughts a little bit. Um, what, what was the very last thing that you said? To, I'm sorry, because I, something came to my mind. What you uh, said. The animism. The animism. Like, so, <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate it. Um, so one thing I thought was really interesting when I was when I was interviewing uh, Danny Garcia in particular, and actually in your comments, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. Is that he said that tree is still alive? There are shoots coming out from the roots and coming out from the remaining burl of a new redwood, and he's absolutely right. That tree was sprouting new growth after it was cut down, and so for him, that was thinking ancestrally in a sense, right? Because he was saying, I, I need this now. The tree is still there because you didn't take up the root ball with it. You know? um, whether that's scientifically true is not, you know, uh, th there's a lot of debate around what a burl means, for instance, and what it provides to the environment and all of this. But technically it's true. I mean, you'd have to wait another 3,000 years to get the same <laughs> benefits. Um, not to be too, uh, I don't want to be too blunt with it, but I think you might like the last line of the book. I think that the poachers understood this, actually. I think that they, when we were speaking about traditional structures of conservation, um, this was, they really understood the kind of colonial way that it had been pressed down upon communities of different kinds in a way that didn't account for understanding of the environment beyond what generally very wealthy, at that point, white uh, business owners who were kind of funding this conservation in the early 20th century, what they saw as right. Um, so I don't think that, um, I think that that's probably something, even if they couldn't put it in as much words, you know, um, it, it's something that's on their mind that they think about in different ways. I don't know if that answers your
I think, um, it, did everyone hear? Should we? Yeah. Um, the history, the early history part of the book talks about this a fair bit. Uh, there is a little bit of uh, discussion around, there's uh, quite a long history of indigenous poaching in Wood Buffalo National Park in Alberta, in northern Alberta, I think. Yeah. Um, and so it, ta it when I discuss the roots of history as a, or sorry, the roots of poaching, as a, a kind of what's the word I'm trying to think of here? Uh, subversive act, uh, I discuss it in there. And uh, Oric has a quite a large indigenous population, um, so it, it is interwoven within that, as well as the final chapters uh, the, that deal with um, community forest management and shifting the way that we conserve parklands now, shifting their ownership away from government structures. Um, but I mean, <sighs> I wanted to report the story naturally, and so the stories that came to me and that I heard uh, were the stories that, that I wrote about, but they, they opened a lot of doors into all sorts of questions like that. The, the challenges that you talk about too in terms of the, the national parks being imposed on these communities and uh -huh. basically just forcing people out. I think in Canada we have a, a history of that too with the national parks um, yeah. when they were um, being put um, in place and, and indigenous yeah. communities being forced out of the park and you know previously using that land to harvest food to support them and then these national parks being imposed and then um, policed in that way. Um, yeah, and the policing thing I think is really interesting, and there there are parts in that book around uh, the militarization of rangers and and ranger culture, um, and how adopting kind of traditional policing methods in the woods has really alienated a lot of people because in the national parks they carry like the. the Rangers I was following in America had AR-15s, you know, so they carry they carry automatic weapons and they wear bulletproof vests and I mean those are the folks that are investigating crimes and knocking on doors in towns of people, right? Saying, "Did you take wood?" So it, it, there's a real impact with that type of imagery. Oh, sorry, were you? No, no. Oh, no. we'll come back to you next. Yeah, and first, so I, and I always, just to give credit, there there's lots of really interesting uh, analyses and stuff of this, and there's a book called Crimes Against Nature, which is really, really good, and um, it talks about poaching of, of all kinds and squatting on national parks and stuff like this, um, but it focuses primarily on the East, um, and there are just <laughs> rife with examples of uh, kind of rural areas being having land bought up en masse, sometimes whole towns being bought up by private owners and fences going up in them say, you are now officially a squatter. <laughs> you need to leave. Access to riverways being taken away, um, not only for food, but for transport. Um, I think, sorry, just one second, because an example came to mind and then it went away. Um, I mean, there's just dozens dozens of, ex of examples throughout history, I guess. Wood Buffalo is really interesting because uh, the response was very active poaching almost right away when that park was instated, which was also relatively recently. Um, in the East Coast, I mean, you had kind of iconic millionaires like the Rockefellers setting up park trusts in New York and Pennsylvania and kicking out poor people because they didn't like the way their yards looked and stuff, and just being very open in newspapers about that. Um, like none of it was very hidden at the time. Yeah. Just so we had a question over here, and then I'll. Yeah, I wanted to drill into. I just found this in the 
Um, I was not able to access that paperwork, so there you go. <laughs> Probably yes, but I, I shouldn't. No. But that was something that you... It does happen for sure, particularly, I mean, the, the Forest Service was a bit more open with me about this in the States, but it, it is not uncommon for a private logging company who's leasing a tract of land to log from the Forest Service to go, you know, 10 meters back beyond where they're meant to go and take so a bit of wood. Not just that the oh. license fee was placed in on, on some land, but whether there are any individual... Oh, whether... Whether people are, are taking for private companies? Yes. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, and there's there's quite a bit of stats around this um, that are kind of calculated by private industry groups. I, I, that is actually a lot of a <laughs> quite a considerable amount of money. I think the last stat uh, said that in tree poaching from private lands, right? That's how I'm understanding this. Private logging lands. Well, not private, but they have the license. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Um, was around $350 million a year worth in the US. So very common. Yeah, sorry, I misunderstood. I think we have time for one question I saw over, over here. I don't think that the retraining thing is around difficulty so much as it is um, really wanting to, to, first of all, stay where they are and perhaps not seeing a lot of opportunity like in physically in the town itself. I don't, I don't, from as far as I know, there's, there isn't anyone kind of keeping stats on the educational background of, of folks that end up kind of getting ticketed or charged with this. I think those, I think you're probably, uh, I mean, you're right in saying that often work in those industries doesn't require uh, extensive, mm -hmm. I mean, it takes training just because you're yeah, not, exactly. you know, yeah, um, it's just a different type of training that, that might not be accessible anymore. Um, yeah. I think, I mean, there's different forms of education is probably how I would approach that. I, I think um, that's not really what I was hearing. I was hearing more that people felt very tied to a place and wanted to stay, and that this was work in that place, and that um, we have yet to kind of keep towns sustainable and, and keep their populations kind of going to, to provide what they need mm -hmm. through outside work, through, uh, through work other than natural resource work. And so the culture had shifted there. I, okay, uh, thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, this has been a great conversation, so thanks for all of your, your great questions as well and um, for taking the time to chat with us and, and tell thanks. us about your book and your process. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for <laughs> So quickly, our friends from Greystone Books are here selling Lindsay's book. Um, so if you want to get a copy, get it there. I believe they're pre signed already. They are. If you want Yeah, I have used uh, the great reporting from the, Nor from the Narwhal in my own research, uh, the wonderful interview or profile of Suzanne Samard in particular, and also the Fairy Creek coverage from the Narwhal was better than everyone else's. So <laughs> there you go. I hope the CBC <laughs> isn't here for that. No, yeah. <laughs> um, just a reminder, they are a member-supported organization, so if you want to figure out how to support them and what that means, uh, go talk to Eric over there. Um, and 
tomorrow, uh, I want to tell you about a couple of events before we wrap up. So, in this very space, tomorrow night, same time, same place, uh, we're hosting Governor General Award winner Daryl McLeod. Daryl uh, wrote a new memoir called Peaco, and it's the story of him growing up in a really difficult childhood, um, then all his triumphs, and essentially it's about reclaiming his Korean dignity. So it's, gonna be, it's a beautiful book, and that conversation is going to be here tomorrow at 7. And then next Wednesday, we're hosting an event about how GIS technology is used by indigenous researchers to map indigenous futures. That's going to be a fascinating panel conversation with two indigenous researchers, so you should come check that out um, next Wednesday. That's going to be online, so when I said come check it out, I mean stay at home and watch <laughs> it from your computer. Um, so that's next Wednesday. If you need more info about that, check our website, come talk to me. Um, there's info on that table over there. Um, and follow us on all of our social channels. We usually promote some of the events. Um, that's all I got. Thank you all for joining us. Have a wonderful night.